It's time for questions to the Minister for Health, and we'll start with listed questions. I call Naomi Long. A question number one, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister. Cordia, and with your permission, I would like to answer questions 1, 11 and 13 together as they relate to the working group on fatal fetal abnormality. I can confirm that both the Justice Minister and I received the working group's report on the 11th of October and were actively concerned at its proposals. You understand that both the Justice Minister and I will want to take some time to consider and reflect on the recommendations. When both the Justice Minister and I are content, the report will be submitted to the Executive for its consideration and then its approval. It's not intended to publish the report nor its recommendations until the executive has concluded its deliberations. The, work, the, group, or the report of the working group on fatal fatal abnormality was developed in line with the terms of reference for the group to consider issues relating to cases of fatal fatal abnormality, including matters addressed in the previous consultation by the Department of Justice, and provide to a report to both the Justice Minister and myself making recommendations including on the positive or the potential legislative change for termination of pregnancy as necessary. The focus of the working group's outreach work was to capture the broadest possible spectrum of views of women, their partners and families who had been impacted by a diagnosis of fatal fetal abnormality, and those of the health professionals providing their care, including representatives of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, the Royal College of General Practitioners, the Royal College of Nursing, the Royal College of Midwives, and the Royal College of Psychiatrists. In considering the trauma that can be suffered by women and their families where a diagnosis of fatal fetal abnormality has been given, the group was guided by the wishes of women, their partners and families regarding any engagement. Those women willing to engage and share their individual experience, whatever that had been, were afforded the opportunity to communicate their experiences to the group, whether that was personally, in writing, or through the public health agency, which has undertaken work with women and their families who have been directly impacted. The Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Nursing Officer met with women also, and they took account of the views of the women who engaged with the PHA through their work. Some of the women continued their pregnancies to term and some did not. I'm grateful to those women and their partners and families who took the time to relay their experiences either directly to the, the Chief Medical the Officer time or up. through the Public Health um, Agency as that can't have been easy for them. I call Naomi Long for a supplementary. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Health Minister um, for the attention that she, I know, has given to this issue, which is a very difficult and very sensitive one. Can I ask the Minister, she has said that she would want to have time to consider it and also to take it to the Executive, but can I ask her why the report cannot now be published so that the public are at least aware of the basis on which the two Ministers, the Justice Minister and Health Minister, will be approaching their Executive colleagues um, and what the recommendations of that report are? Well, I'm happy to discuss the, the recommendations of the report um, with the member and other members of this House in due course. I've only received it last week. Actually, I think it was this day last week we received it um, Tuesday evening. So myself and the Justice Minister will want to give it some consideration. I think that's um, normal practice. We will then obviously want to, based on the recommendations in the report, bring it to the executive for discussion and then obviously um, hopefully chart a way forward in terms of how we're going to support those women that, that need our support. Um, so I look forward to being able to progress the report as quickly as possible. I have been very keen to make sure that we completed the work of the working group and very keen that we're able to, to move forward and provide the assurance that people are asking us to provide. I call Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your reply. And uh, many of the points have already been raised by the previous speakers we've come through. But I would just like to re-emphasise whether you will give the public commitment that we will actually have these findings put to us as soon as possible through the Assembly and actually not leaked through the media or any other form that seems to be the purpose of this government at the present moment in time. Okay, it's, it's unfortunate that, again, the opposition are trying to use something that was, which is a really, really sensitive issue and a very, very complicated and emotive issue for anybody who finds themselves in that scenario. I have the best will and the best intention towards those women who need our support. So with that best will, I will bring a paper to the executive, like I have just said, that I will um, consider the recommendations of the professional people and all those people who found themselves in this scenario who have um, given information to, to the working group. So it's been a good piece of work. I look forward to bringing that proposal to the executive and making sure what we have is fit for purpose structures in place and supports in place that allow those women who find themselves and their families with a diagnosis of fatal fetal abnormality to make sure they receive first class support. I call Stephen Agnew. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that this very much is a health issue and should be treated as such? Um, and notwithstanding what she said about the recommendations of the report, um, is, it, is it something that she will seek to progress, that this becomes a medical issue and not a criminal justice issue? 
Yes, I think that it is so important that we do um, look at how we as a health service provide, and we are obviously where um, people would turn to for help and support. So where those women turn to for help and support, then they need to have that adequate, appropriate supports in place. So I'm very glad to be part of this piece of work. I'm very glad that myself and the Justice Minister have been able to progress it as soon as we took office. So now that we have the report, we'll work our way through the recommendations and we'll bring forward um, what, what we need to in terms of legislative change based on the report. So I think that it's been a very collaborative piece of work, but, um, I, and I thank the member for his continued interest. And I look forward to updating the House on the way forward as soon as we possibly can. I call David Ford. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I entirely accept that the Minister, indeed the two Ministers, cannot take action on this issue without executive approval, but it's entirely within their gift to publish the report which has been presented to them. Given the sensitivity of the issue, given the widespread public concern, will the Minister commit to discussing with the Justice Minister the immediate release of the report before any action can be agreed by the Executive? Well, we have a duty as, as legislators to legislate and we have to do that based on the evidence that we have before us. So myself and the Justice Minister, we only have the report a week and we said that we would look at it collectively with nothing to hide. It's a report that's been done by professionals. It's work that's also been informed by the, the previous piece of work which yourself was involved with as Justice Minister in terms of the consultation. So we've taken into account all of those factors. We've taken into account as wide a range of possible views as we possibly can because it's very important, I think, that we, when we move forward and we take decisions uh, uh, that are in the best interest of women that we do so based on the evidence which we have before us. So I'm very happy to, to say to the member that I won't be found wanting in terms of trying to bring the issue forward to the fore as quickly as we possibly can. It's something that's been in the ether for far too long and something that we need to resolve. I call Sammy Douglas. Number two, please. With your permission, again, can Corlea, I'll answer questions two and 14 together. Progress uh, or building on progress is an important contribution to my work to champion mental health, which is one of my top priorities. I was pleased to meet a delegation from the Royal College of Psychiatrists recently to discuss it in detail. The report acknowledges that there have been improvements in provision in recent years and the Commission found many good services. It highlights issues in relation to funding, treatment access, community and specialist services, structures and data. It makes eight recommendations for improvement, including the key point that mental health must be given equal priority with physical health. The findings are largely consistent with my vision for mental health and I intend that my plans based on six principles will contribute to improvements in line with an outcomes focused programme for government. Firstly, I am committed to moving forward towards parity of esteem. Secondly, I want to develop and sustain a, culture, a recovery culture. Thirdly, involvement by people with lived experience in the design and delivery and evaluation of services I believe is essential. Mental health is leading the way in terms of developing co-production, collaboration between people and who provide care and people with lived experience. And that's resulted in the development of networks and the employment of people with lived experience as recovery consultants. And just last week, actually, I launched um, another recovery hub in the South Southern Trust, which was actually a really, really good example of that co-production and co-design. The fourth principle, which um, I wish to adhere to is service development where resources allow. The Bamford evaluation, which is going to report to me eminently, has um, outlined the needs and gaps in services. And emerging findings include a need for more emphasis on carers, provision, and crisis support. And my officials are developing options on the physical monitoring of people with mental illness, a regional perinatal service, CAM services and improved early intervention, eating disorder services, psychological therapies, mental trauma, personality disorders provision in the justice system, safe places for people suffering from dual diagnosis, and implementation of Mental Capacity Act. The fifth stroke principle is the structural reform and performance management, and the board is leading on that area of work. Finally, I plan to um, closely work with the ministers in the south to explore the potential for developing some of these um, services on an online basis, because I think that will make it more feasible for us to develop some of these services in a more timely manner. I call Sammy Doug Douglas for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for a very comprehensive um, uh, report there. Um, could I ask the Minister if she could update the House on child and adolescent mental health services, please? Child and adolescent mental health services are delivered under a stepped care model, and the Health and Social Care Board leads a reform process under the auspices of the stepped care model implementation review. Much progress has been made, but more needs to be done, particularly in relation to investment in community and specialist services, workforce planning and recruitment. CAM's investment now exceeds 20 million annually, and I'm considering reform and investment options across a range of mental health services, including child and adolescent mental health services. This will include work with other departments on comprehensive early years support. Regional acute inpatient services at Beechcroft are frequently under pressure, 
An independent review of 2014, in 2014 concluded that the current 33 bed model is appropriate, but crucially that this is dependent on the further strengthening of crisis resolution and home treatment services. In addition, and in line with the independent review's recommendation, a managed care network of acute child and adolescent mental health services has been established, and this will bring acute services into one managed system, with, uh, which will ensure greater consistency across the region and streamlined access to Beechcroft. Aram, sir, Mark Durkin. I call Mark Durkin. Well, a free old yes, young Cordia. I thank the Minister for her answers thus far and welcome the commitments that, that she has given uh, to the work that she will do on mental health as we move forward. But could the Minister uh, inform the House what percentage of her budget is currently allocated to mental health services? Yes, and I think that what we have is an improving picture. In the past decade, the annual allocation of, um, to mental health services has increased from 200 million to over 250 million, so it's approximately about 250 million. And on the basis of last year's commissioning plan, actually that figure was um, confirmed as approximately 250 million, which represents just over 5.5% of the DEL, so the department's expenditure limit of 4.7 billion. The participation and practice of mental health rights campaign has said recently that um, only 8.5% of the overall health budget was allocated to mental health for 15-16, despite evidence suggesting that the, health, the mental health amount um, equates to about 25% of total cases. So I think that considers that it's broadly accurate, and despite increases in the annual allocation to mental health services from 200 million a decade ago to 250 million now, it's clear that more investment is needed, and I've already highlighted how I intend to take that investment forward. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I also thank the Minister for her answer? And as we know, there's long been calls for a party of esteem between physical and mental health, uh, something that I have fully supported as well. And the report simply adds to these appeals. Can I ask the Minister to tell us what she believes each of the legal barriers to party currently are? I don't think it's about legal barriers. I think it's about proper access to services. Party of esteem, I think, sometimes can be taken as meaning. Uh, uh, the same amount of money being applied to physical health as to mental health, but that's clearly not what the report says. It's clearly not my intention. My intention is to improve the picture. My intention is to invest along all the service developments, which I've already included, and one of the things that's going to inform that process is the actual review of the Bamford evaluation, which is going to give us, I think, the evidence in order to move forward. Um, I've highlighted mental health as, as one of the areas which I want to prioritise. I think that we can do more. I think that we have excellent services out there. We have brilliant community and voluntary sector. We have so many partners who want to work together to deliver better outcomes for all those people who find themselves mentally um, ill. We also have a lot of good work in relation to the positive mental health and wellbeing message. And last week for World Mental Health Day, we were able to launch the anti-stigma campaign because that still is a key factor in relation to mental health, stigma and people being afraid to talk about it and to ask for support. And for it's okay to, I think there was a saying that, that it's, it's okay not to be okay and it's okay to ask for help. So I think that that's important in relation to mental health. So I, I clearly prioritise this as an area where I will want to work towards party esteem, but I think it's important that people understand what party of esteem means for mental health. I call Carla Lockhart. Question three, Minister. Ensuring that the right services are in place for treating and supporting women and their families during what can be a very distressing time is of great importance to me. I am pleased to be able to say that following work by the public health agency with trusts and patient groups to consider issues of variation across early pregnancy services, a commissioning intention and referral pathway were developed and issued in June this year. The commissioning intention asks that the trust, uh, ask the trust to ensure that they have appropriate arrangements in place to facilitate rapid access to care for women with problems at any stage of pregnancy. In line with NICE guidance, trusts have been asked to ensure that in relation to problems in early pregnancy, a system is put in place to enable women referred to an early pregnancy assessment service or EPAS to attend within 24 hours if the clinic, clinical situation warrants this. These arrangements are now in place in two of the trusts and the PHA will be reviewing progress with all the trusts in December of this year. Carla Lockhart for supplementary. Thank you, and can I thank the Minister for that very positive uh, response. You will be aware that, that one in five pregnancies miscarry. Women who present in A&E, particularly at weekends when early pregnancy clinics are not open, are often subjected to long waits and uh, toilet facilities that aren't appropriate. So can the Minister uh, give assurances to this House that she is going to prioritise the suggestions made by the Patient Client Council and improve the overall service uh, offered at this difficult time? Yeah, I thank the Member for, um, for her comments and, and absolutely agree that we need to support those women who find themselves in, in that scenario. And I think that absolutely we have to take on board the, the guidance and the suggestions that have been made by the Patient Client Council and we're actively doing that. 
Um, all trusts provide services and support for women who have miscarried and probably from varying degree depending on what trust you're in. So I think it's important that we have consistency and that people know what support is there and know um, how, how they can access it. So um, I think there's been a lot of good work done and we have um, our, mid our midwives, and our obstetrics, gynecology staff, all of those people have been now um, been given written information to give them guidance just in terms of how they support um, those women. And I think that it's important that we continue to build on that and, and, and we listen to the patient voice. And that's certainly going to be my message and my mantra for going forward. We have to listen to the patient voice, to the carer voice, to the family voice, and make sure we design supports and services for people that need them. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, experience problem, experiencing problems during pregnancy, Minister, can be a stressful time for any expectant mother. Would the Minister accept, however, that for a seven-day service to work, Women absolutely need to be able to self-refer in order to avoid getting caught up in the current turmoil in the general practices. I think women obviously attend when needed um, through a varying number of, of routes, perhaps from GP referrals, perhaps straight into A&E. So it's important that what we have is that all clinicians have the guidance in place that allows women to, um, th to support those women who find themselves um, with a miscarriage. So I think that what we need to have is consistency right across all of the trusts, and I think that the guidance really helps us to be able to do that. We should have 24-7 access and support for those women who find themselves dealing with miscarriage. I think that we have... Um, with, in, in listening to patients and listening with the work that was done with the patient client council, the, the, the fact the guidelines are in place shows that we are listening, and I think that shows that the, there is an improving picture. Erin, sir, Linda Dillon. I call Linda Dillon. Maramaya, good evening, and thank the minister for her answer so far. Can the minister detail what services are available for women who experience recurrent miscarriage, given that obviously this carries with it an awful lot of distress? Um, yeah, well, again, all trusts have pathways in place for women who have had previous um, early losses or a history of a previous ectopic pregnancy, with women referred to maternity or gynaecology team or dedicated clinic as required on assessment of individual needs. As part of the implementation of the strategy for maternity care 2012-2018, to actions are being taken to standardise services for women who experience recurrent miscarriage by clarifying and standardising referral criteria and pathways and developing guidance for GPs on appropriate referral. This work is currently underway and the board and the public health agency, as I said, have engaged with the patient client council in relation to issues raised by service users. And I just think it's so important that women know what services there are, particularly if they find themselves in a recurrent miscarriage situation. They need to know that they're going to be supported and they need to know how they can get that help. Here I'm Sir Sinead Bradley. I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, has the Minister any plans to introduce routine screening for Group B strep? It's something that I'm certainly considering. It's, um, I know there's, there's quite a, a, a lobby and a campaign for it, so it's something that I'm considering in terms of going forward. We obviously have limited resources, and we have to make sure we target those at, at those most in need. But um, yes, I am considering it, and, and I'm actively um, looking at the issue. I call Jim Allister. Question four. Decisions about the provision of services at Causeway Hospital are a matter for the Northern Health and Social Care Trust in the first instance. As I said in the recent adjournment debate on health service provision in North Antrim, the Northern Trust has no plans to move away from the model currently in place in which acute hospital services for its area are delivered from the, co from the causeway and the Antrim area hospitals. The reconfiguration of services is an important and complex matter that goes beyond individual trusts and hospitals. I have given careful consideration to the implications of the expert panel's report and will publish it and my response to it on the 25th of October. Jim Allister for a supplementary. I suggest the Minister could do better. Uh, her predecessor was able to commit in this House to the continuance the of, member a question? of acute services. Uh, the fact that she hasn't been able to do that today will be very disconcerting for my constituents. Has the member a question, uh, please? Why is she uh, an, even anticipating reducing the level of service to a hospital which provides for much of North Antrim and East London Derry? She could, as I suggest, do better. And I would suggest that the member could do better to listen, because what I clearly said was that the Northern Trust has no current plans to move away from the model currently in place. I have said that, and I said it in a recent debate, so um, I'll rehearse it again. The Northern Trust has said it's no plans to move away from the model currently in place. But 
To say that we never can change anything, or we can never reconfigure services, or we can never do better, is a bit of an ostrich mentality. To stick your head in the sand, let's keep doing things over and over and hoping for better outcomes. That's not what we can continue to do in health and social care. I've clearly set out that I'm going to set out on the 25th of October how we're going to transform health and social care right across the board. And what's most important is that we deliver better outcomes for health and social care, that we make sure pe people live longer, because people are living longer with more complex conditions, and the reason they're doing that is because our health service is good. Our health service is delivering um, day and daily services that support people, and I think it, it would do well for the members of this House to recognise that more and more. I think in terms of moving forward, I have clearly set out that we are going to clearly have to reconfigure how we deliver health and social care. And that does not mean that we have to have every service in every hospital. What that means is that we deliver first-class outcomes that we can stand over and people are content with that. That is the, tr the transformation piece which I will be announcing and discussing in this House next week. I call Maris Bradley. Thank you, Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that the Causeway Hospital is an integral part of the North West health in infrastructure, and many tourist-based events, such as the North West, North West 200, need the support that the hospital lends for the success and the safety of such events? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that the current services at Causeway Hospital, it's, and it's the Trust's view that um, the, both its hospitals, acute hospitals at Causeway and Antrim, are developed to support and to work in, in collaboratively to provide a strong sustainable model for acute services. And those two hospitals also network with other acute services, especially in Belfast and the West. The two hospitals need to be right-sized and properly resourced to meet the demand now in the future to support the events which you, which you refer to. So I think the, the Trust has not never shied away from saying that they see it as a valuable and, and um, integral part of their, trust, of their health and social care provision. Aaron, sir, Philip McGuigan. I call Philip McGuigan. Gura Melgood, uh, Priya Last can call you. Uh, can I thank the, the Minister for her comments with regard to uh, the two hospitals? And can I ask uh, the Minister uh, how prepared her department is for the pressures of winter in the months ahead? Um, Yes, as we enter into the winter, winter period, there are the, the annual pressures which all of our, our hospitals will face. I have allocated £13 million from the June monitoring round for unscheduled care and winter pressures. That funding will be invested in a number of areas to improve patient flow in unscheduled care, including winter pressures, capacity, expansion on acute sites and staffing within emergency departments. The Northern Trust share of that funding is £1.697 million, and some of that funding will be used to increase capacity for short-stay, fast turnaround for appropriate patients who come to the emergency departments in Antrim and in Causeway Hospitals. This includes the development of a direct assessment unit within Causeway Hospital to enhance assessment capacity and improve emergency flow, uh, department flow. Other measures at Causeway also include improved discharge processes and increased pharmacy support. Measures outside of the hospital setting include expanding the Trust's nursing home in-reach service, improving access to starting new domiciliary care packages at the weekend, managing the community re rehabilitation bed-based services, and working with care homes to ensure there is capacity for short stays as well as long-term placements over the winter period. Sir, Connor Murphy. I call Connor Murphy. An adoption and children's bill has been drafted. The bill is principally intended to modernise the legal framework for adoption in the North and place children's welfare at the centre of the adoption decision making processes. The current laws on adoption is the Adoption Order 1987. It is based on the English legislation drafted in the early 1970s and therefore reflects practice that is effectively 40 years old. This bill will deliver a framework for adoption which is more consistent with the principles and provisions of the Children's Order 1995 and international human rights requirements. The substance of the bill relates to adoption, although I propose to also make changes in the Children's Order. The bill will be substantive in size. The current draft contains approximately 140 clauses and five schedules. The bill, in the main, is based on policy proposals consulted on in 2006. However, it also contains new provisions not previously consulted on, but which I will consider will deliver improved outcomes for children and young people, both in relation to adoption and children's social care. As part of the consultation on the bill, I will also seek the views of a number of further proposed changes to adoption, safeguarding and children's legislation. I firmly believe that it is extremely important that an adoption and children's bill is introduced as soon as possible. The bill is long overdue. I therefore intend to seek executive agreement to consult on the draft adoption and children's bill with the intention of inducing or introducing the bill in the Assembly as soon as possible in the current mandate. Conor Murphy for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer to date and I am sure uh, uh, most people will be very uh, pleased that there is movement uh, on this issue. Uh, can the Minister outline 
uh, what policy proposals in around this that uh, she is preparing to consult on. Professor Alexis Jay undertook a review of the Safeguarding Board in April of this year and or last year, and the review report was submitted to the department and I accepted all the report's findings in August of this year. One of the key recommendations of that report was that in the longer term the creation of a statutory child protection partnership should be considered as a replacement for the Safeguarding Board, with wider safeguarding sitting within an overarching children and young people strategic partnership. I intend to consult on whether the, um, to include additional provisions in the Adoption and Children's Bill to establish a statutory child protection partnership and to place the CYPSP on a statutory basis. I also intend to consult on the duty to, of Health and Social Care Board to provide information about adoption support services, to introduce a right for descendants of adopted people to access records and intermediary services, to place arrangements for duly approved placements that is individuals or couples approved to foster or adopt on a statutory basis, amend the children's order to strengthen arrangements in respect of private foster carers, to seek views on the introduction of contact, no contact orders to ensure that the authorities are clear that their duty is to safeguard and promote the welfare of looked after children when making contact arrangements. I call Harold McKee. I thank the Minister for her answers this far. Is the Minister aware that many adopters in Northern Ireland view themselves as third-class citizens when they see the greater support for those who adopt in other regions of the UK? Can the Minister give a commitment that any new adoption legislation will rectify that, so that adoptive families here will receive the support they deserve and require? I think it's um, extremely important that we support adoptive parents. Um, uh, Particularly, I've recently uh, met Adoption a &I, and this is one of the issues which we discussed. And one of the things that the bill is actually looking at is um, defining adoption support services to mean that we provide counselling, advice, and information for adoptive parents. It's also about other service, services that are prescribed by regulations in relation to adoption. So I think this bill will give us an opportunity to strengthen the supports that are there for those people who are adoptive parents, and it makes a places a statutory duty on adoption authorities to make sure that arrangements are put in place for the provision of support services that are specified in regulations. So I think this bill is, is timely and is going to support those parents who um, adopt um, children and, and need all the support that we can possibly give them. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Can, can you assure the House that the consultation process regarding the um, legislation will be in keeping with Equality Commission guidelines and that the questions in it will not be leading and biased towards heterosexual married couples from the same religion? I will always be guided by equality principles and I can assure the members that um, whenever I go out to consult, she'll, she'll be, that'll be very evident in terms of the consultation paper that goes forward. Um, there's been a lot of um, talk and an issue in relation to this. There's been a lot of court cases in relation to this. I think it's about time that we moved on and put it on a statutory footing. I call Richie McPhillips. Aaron, sir, Richie McPhillips. Thank you, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker, uh, and thanks to the Minister for her answer so, thus far. Uh, can the Minister uh, advise as to whether her department has any plans to increase the number of foster carers here? Well, we're continually looking for um, more foster carers to come forward. We have about 2,200 um, some odds, um, children in care who need our support and need um, more people to come forward. So we're actively involved in um, working with other departments, working with key stakeholders to make sure we raise awareness about how rewarding and fulfilling foster care is, and make sure that we provide more support, particularly in relation to kins kinship. And we're doing a lot of awareness around that also. So I think that we have to continue to do more to, to make sure that we have more people who come forward to, to want to adopt, because uh, certainly anybody I've encountered who, who fosters or adopts find it very rewarding albeit very challenging and, and why they need the supports that we talked about earlier, but um, it's so important that more and more people come forward and, and get, provide a loving home for those children who find themselves in care. I call Danny Kennedy. Number six, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, this question is very timely, as members will be aware that we are in the process of debating the issue of cancer services this afternoon. The performance figures for breast cancer in the Southern Trust of, for June are entirely unacceptable, but it's important to understand the full picture of what lies behind those statistics. Out of the 209 patients who waited longer than 14 days for a breast cancer referral in the month of June in the Southern Trust, 12 subsequently had a di confirmed diagnosis of breast cancer, 94.3% did not have a cancer diagnosis. All of the 12 patients with a confirmed diagnosis have commenced treatment. 10 received their first definitive cancer treatment within the 62 days, which means that the initial delay in diagnosis had no negative impact on their receiving treatment within a reasonable amount of time. 
One received their first treatment at day 63, just outside the 62-day target, and the final patient was a more complex case and treatment did not commence until day 81. I want to reassure people who may have sick loved ones or who may be unwell themselves that the level of care that they will receive from doctors and nurses here is second to none. My department is working with colleagues in Health and Social Care Board and the Trust to do everything possible to improve performance. The arrangements that have been put in place for other trusts to help with the Southern Trust breast cancer referrals have already had a very positive impact. Provisional information shows that performance management has greatly improved. 78% in the Southern Trust in September and I believe it's up to 100% today. The Trust continue to work along with the Board to continue to seek to resolve issues and a workshop is scheduled for the 26th of October which is identifying options for delivering a sustainable high quality breast cancer service. And unfortunately there's no time for a supplementary. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions and I call Andy Allen. So Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister if her department has any policy in relation to accessible health care information for those with sight loss? I do believe that we do, and I'll clarify for that for the member when I um, leave question time, but I do believe that we have strong policies in place, and if we didn't, I would certainly rectify that situation. Supplementary for Andy Allen. I thank the Minister for answer. Minister, um, I, I've been engaging with the RNIB who are, are promoting accessible health care information, and they believe there's, there's difficulties there for individuals. Would you be content to meet with myself and the RNIB to discuss that, Minister? Yes, I'm content. If the member wants to drop me an email, then we can arrange something in the future. Iram, sir, Alec Ashwood. I call Alec Ashwood. The Minister in earlier questions referred to women who suffered miscarriages. Uh, could I ask the Minister about mm -hmm. a woman who had difficulty to conceive and ask what her view is and what her plans might be uh, in order to enhance IVF provision uh, beyond the current provision uh, for women who uh, require multiple cycles of IVF in an effort to conceive a baby? Well, um, I think it's disappointing that the health service at this stage is not able to provide the optimum three cycles, and that's obviously something which I want to work towards. Um, I've said that publicly, and I've been involved in, in saying that even as far back as when I was in the health committee many, many years ago. Um, I think that uh, the fact that we have only one cycle in place now is not the optimum number, because NICE, NICE guidelines clearly um, says that the optimum number of cycles is three. So I certainly want to work towards that. Um, obviously one of our biggest challenges in the health service is the funding issue and being able to resource all these things that you want to be able to do but it's my intention to work towards being able to fight those three, three optimum cycles. Alec Ashwood for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. Could I press her a bit further welcoming her commitment uh, to uh, the optimum level of cycles. Is there any plans within your department or in the PFG to even on a phased base Cases moved to three cycles of full treatment compared with the one cycle of less than full treatment that women have in Northern Ireland at the moment? The member will know the approach to the PFG is about outcomes focus and it talks about um, building better lives and for, for individuals so that, so that could be, mean an awful lot of things to an awful lot of people. Um, for me, I want to work to the point where anybody who is struggling to conceive gets the best support from the health service. As I said, I will certainly work towards that. My biggest challenge in relation to IVF and being able to provide that support is a financial challenge. Um, there's so many things that I would want to do as a health minister, so many things that I would wish I could just change tomorrow. Because, because if you find yourself in that scenario, then you, you need, you, you're asking for support. Not everybody can afford to go out and pay for additional cycles themselves. So um, the optimum number of cycles, three cycles, is what I want to work towards. I call Alec Easton. Uh, Deputy Principal uh, Speaker, could I ask the Minister what plans would the South Eastern Trust have to deal with any additional winter pressures, especially on beds? Well, as I said in answer to the previous question, I allocated £13 million um, pounds for winter pressures, which is going to deal with a range of things, both in the acute setting, but also what else we can do in the community to help people from actually needing to go to use acute, acute services. Uh, in relation to the breakdown of um, South Eastern Trust, I don't have that figure, but they did receive their allocation of the £13 million to help them uh, adjust to deal with what is obviously an annual problem in, in all of our um, health and social care settings. Alex Easton for a supplementary. Thank you. Thank the Minister so far for answer. Could I ask the Minister would she consider reopening the Bangor GP ward to deal with any additional bed pressures? Um, it's an issue, an operational issue for the Trust. Um, it's not something that I have looked at before, but I'm happy to, to provide information to the member in writing in relation to the Trust's intention to, to look at that. Aaron, sir, Justin McNulty. I call Justin McNulty. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. 
The Minister will be aware of the real pressures in GP practices, especially in places like rural South Armagh and rural Fermanagh. This pressure has now reached urban areas, with many practices at risk of collapsing question. or being forced to close. A large practice in County Armagh is operating as of last week with ad hoc local cover. the Member a question? Can the Minister give an urgent assurance that she will help, support and invest in frontline services in GP practices? Indeed I can, and I have done so on many occasions in this House. I think that um, the issues which we face in GP services and aging, and aging profile of, of the GPs themselves, um, a number of GPs retiring. So we have to look at the workforce issues and, and how can we address that, that picture. One of the things that I'm currently considering is the working group, which the, the GPs um, have, have uh, GP workforce action plan, which has come forward to me, and I'm going to. Um, I am considering that, actively considering that, and looking at how we can support GPs. Um, we haven't been found wanting in terms of supporting GPs, and over the last year, we've seen significant investment, 1.6 million per annum. For, to commission an additional 20 GP places over 16, 17 years. We are um, launched and an, an in the process of a five-year investment in bringing pharmacy into GP practices. We are going to put close to 300 pharmacists into GP practices. So for me, it is about investing in primary care. And you know, many, many reports over the years have told us that we have to invest in primary care if we are going to um, improve, improve this picture. And it is about making sure we have no, it's not just about GPs, it's about multidisciplinary teams, it's about the allied health professionals, it's about the community health visitor, it's about the district nurse, it's about all those people working in partnership to make sure we have first class primary care. Justin McNulty for a supplementary. Your predecessor announced 10 million capital funding, of which more than 9 million has not been drawn down and returned to the Treasury. Can I ask the Minister what are you going to do for GPs now? by way of a rescue package that can go into frontline general practice before large areas of my constituency are left without a GP? I think I have already answered that. I have said where we have not been found wanting in terms of investing in GP surgeries. GPs are under pressure for the reasons that I have just highlighted, so we have to work with them. We now have the working group, which has reported and identified a number of issues, particularly in relation to increasing the number of GP training places. So we are going to, I think, in terms of going forward, my whole focus will be on investment in primary care. So it is about not just the GPs, it is about the whole picture in primary care. Gary, I call Gary Middleton. Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister will be aware that within uh, my own constituent foil, um, we have some of the highest suicide ra rates in the UK. Uh, what involvement has the Minister had in relation to a crisis intervention service uh, for the North West? I haven't visited the crisis intervention centre yet, but I think that we need to do, all need to do more in relation to suicide prevention, and it's a holistic approach. It's not just about the Department of Health's approach, it's about education, it's about uh, do people have a job, do they have access to a home. So it's about all of those things, and one of the things that I'm now currently doing is um, consulting on the new Protect Life 2 strategy, which is clearly bringing all the partners together, um, and I think that that's going to be um, really key in terms of setting out what's our new direction of travel. What's been working well, and what can we do more of? So uh, I'm really encourage anybody who hasn't responded to that consultation yet to do so, and let's improve what we do in terms of suicide prevention in a holistic, collective way. Gary Middleton for a supplement. Can I thank the minister for her answer? The minister may not be aware, but the um, the council have costed a proposal for a service at a value of 170,000 pounds, 40,000 of which they have uh, committed themselves. Has the member themselves. a question? Will the minister be willing to meet with the council to look at how uh, they could source funding for this service? Yes, obviously, um, I'm always happy to discuss um, any of these proposals, but I think that we need people to come at it from a collective point of view and a, and a, and a creative point of view. We don't have an unlimited pot of money to do all these things that we want to do, so it's important that we tailor resources towards those things that are most effective and actually can, we can prove that they actually deliver better outcomes. But I'm always very happy to, to work in conjunction with councils and other partners to make sure that we collectively um, knock our heads together and do things better. I call Christopher Stalford for a question. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how successful she assesses that the unscheduled care directed missions unit for the elderly in Belfast City Hospital has been? I don't have particular information in relation to that, so I'll have to provide it to the member in writing. But um, I think that the unscheduled care is something where we need to focus, where that will actually help us from um, people being distracted. If you're on a waiting list, you're due to go in tomorrow morning, and then obviously something happens, other people are, are, are need to be seen first, and then that interrupts the surgery. So I think it's important that we look towards how can we effectively deliver um, the unscheduled care, um, how can we deliver um, scheduled care more efficiently, and make sure that then that we take the pressure off the acute services and A&Es and, &Es and what have you. I call Christopher Stalford for <coughs> supplementary. I'm grateful, uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, for the Minister's response. The right. Minister will be aware that uh, 
I think the future for the City Hospital lies in becoming a centre for specialisms. Uh, does the Minister have any idea or any plans in terms of additional specialist care fees that can be provided out of the City Hospital? See, I think all of our hospitals can do more and all of our hospitals could become specialists in various fields. So I think that, that is one of the things that I think that we need to do better in the time ahead. I think that we can continue to provide everything in every hospital, but what we could do is make every hospital a specialist in something, make every hospital, where possible, um, able to provide first-class outcomes, whether it be for stroke services or whether it be for urology, no matter what it is, if you provide, if you can get better outcomes, I think people are prepared to travel that wee bit further to get them. So in relation to the individual plans for the Belfast Trust and what their future is, I don't have that detail, but I'm very happy to, again to give that to the member in writing. I call Maris Bradley. Deputy Principal Speaker, can I ask the Minister if she could give any assurance that existing services at the Causeway Hospital, like maternity, will remain and services like orthopaedics could return in the near future? As I said, I answered the question earlier just in relation to what the Trust's current plans are and that they don't have um, any major plans to change. But I think that in going forward, one of the things that we're going to do with the whole transformation and, and, and making sure we reconfigure services that deliver better outcomes for individuals. One of the things that we, that we need to do is to be clinician-led. The decisions about where, um, where we should provide services should be done in conjunction with patients' cares, but clinician-led, because if a doctor tells me I get a better outcome, if, if I go to, for example, Craig Avon for, for stroke services or I go to the Belfast um, City Hospital for, for another service, then that's what I think we should be guided by. So very much for me going forward, what we're going to do is make sure that decisions are taken based on the better, the better outcomes for individuals, that we have a better and healthier population. Maurice Bradley for supplement. Thank you, Deputy Principal, Principal Speaker. Uh, no, thank the, the Minister for her answers. and not want to put the Minister on the spot, but would she consider visiting the Causeway Hospital in the near future? I, I'm quite sure I'll make my way there at some stage. I've had many invitations. I've, I've a very large inbox of invitations, and I do want to get out, and I want to be a minister that engages. I do believe in listening to people on the front line. I do believe in listening to staff, patients and carers. So um, I, I'm quite sure that um, I'll be able to take the member up on that offer at some stage in the future. Aaron, sir, Fran McCann. I call Fran McCann. Yeah, I'll get uh, pre last comment, Corla. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, will the minister say if she will be given evidence to the pay review body in 2017-18 pay rent? Yes, um, I will. We've actually started that piece of work already, and um, I intend to um, feed into that in the time ahead. Uh, just in terms of time scale, yeah, we provided the pay reviews body with a mandate for the 17-18 pay review round in respect of all staff paid under agenda for change and all doctors and dentists in August. So I'm going to shortly be issuing evidence to support and inform the body's recommendations. Fran McCann for supplementary. And, uh, thank, you, thank you, Minister, for her answer uh, thus far. And, uh, can't you uh, provide an update on the 1% pay award? Yes, I can. Um, the payroll team in the Business Services Organisation has provided assurances that the majority of staff will receive their uplift and arrears in their November pay. Um, the pay will be awarded and backdated to the 1st of April of this year. There will be a number of people who require manual uplifts, which will receive their payments in December or January, but the vast majority will be paid in their November pay. Here I'm Sir Catherine Seeley. I call Catherine Seeley. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in light of the British Government's announcement of the intention to replace student nurse bursaries with loans, will the Minister clarify her intentions in regards to bursary support locally? Yes, I can say that, um, <clears throat> well, for one, that I'm very proud of our local nursing and midwifery staff, and I think it's entirely right that we continue to support um, their student nurses through their pre-registration training. I'm therefore very happy to confirm that I have no intention of going down the route of being, um, followed, that's being followed in England. Bursary support for student nurses and midwives will continue. Catherine Seeley for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her response and indeed welcome uh, her intention. Can I also ask the Minister that given the current shortage in nursing, will the Minister consider increasing the numbers of student nursing places at our local universities? The department actually increased the number of student places for the 16-17 academic year by over 100, and I'm committed to maintaining this level as a minimum in 17-18, but I'm also considering options for even further increases as I develop my department's budget for the coming year. Or Linda Dillon. I call Linda Dillon. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the first meeting of the Strategic Health Partnership Forum last week? Yes, I chaired the inaugural meeting of the Strategic Health Partnership Forum last Wednesday, and it was attended by my department's senior management team, trust chief executives, 
and nine staff side representatives. I believe the meeting was a first step and very positive in terms of contributing to the, the, the um, strategic direction of health policy. And I, want to look, and I look forward to working with within the forum as we develop and, and shape policies for the future that deliver first-class health service. And I think that the first meeting was a positive one where we agreed and discussed terms of reference. But I look forward to working with that forum in the years, uh, in the years ahead. And Linda Dillon for a quick supplementary. Gormaugat, can the Minister confirm if the Forum will discuss the transformation in the aftermath of the pu publishing of the Bengoa report? And quick answer from Yes, the I've committed to chair in the next um, meeting next month, actually, on the back of my announcement in relation to Professor Bengoa's report. We must now move on to um, questions to the Minister for Inter